Uh, good evening, councillors, and uh, good evening, uh, everybody. It's 6pm um, on Tuesday, the 13th of October 2020. I'd like to declare um, our agenda briefing open. I'm Mayor Patrick Hall. I now declare the agenda briefing um, started. I uh, would like to start, of course, by acknowledging the Wadjuk people, the traditional custodians of this land. Thank you. We also pay our respects to elders, both past and present. Uh, tonight's meeting is for the purpose of asking questions and seeking clarification on agenda items for the next ordinary council meeting. No decision making or entering into debate is to occur at this meeting. Um, may I ask everyone present this evening to turn off electronic devices? That will include um, mobile phones, iPads and tablets for the duration of the briefing. Um, just on that, uh, I am going to leave mine on. Apologies, I've got a bit of a uh, personal um, crisis occurring at the moment. Uh, not that everybody needs to know. Um, my um, brother's in surgery and I'm expecting a call. So I may have to leave the meeting at some stage and I'm just leaving my phone on for that purpose. So I apologise in advance. Uh, tonight's agenda briefing is being recorded. A copy of the audio recording shall be available. Uh, that'll be available on the city's website within 72 hours of the completion of tonight's meeting. Uh, gender briefings are public meetings and any information you provide may be publicly accessible. Attendance uh, for this evening, I've been advised that Councillor Ponaturai uh, is on her way but has been unavoidably detained and will be about uh, 10 minutes late. Uh, Councillor Lindsay Holland is an apology for night. Uh, for the purpose of the record, he's requested a leave of absence from Council from October the 11th, which was yesterday, to the 25th of October. Um, that decision, whether or not to grant his leave, uh, will be considered at the ordinary Council meeting next Tuesday night on the 20th. Uh, irrespective of that, Councillor Holland is not here this evening. Approved uh, leave of absence, uh, there are none at item 2.2. Uh, disclosures of interest. I might just ask the uh, CEO to uh, deal with those. Chief Executive Officer, disclosures of interest under item three. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I've received two declarations of interest. Um, in the case of myself, it's in, um, I've lodged a, a declaration of interest, which is financial, in relation to item CC 059 20. Uh, page two of the item circulated under a separate confidential cover. Um, the item details is the Chief Executive Officer contract term. The nature of the association or interest is renewal of the contract of employment. I've also received a declaration of impartiality from Councillor Kunza um, in relation to item CC-056-20, page 56 on the agenda. It is a new lease request subject to surrender of existing lease Communicare Riverton. Uh, the nature of the association is Council Kunza is a board member of the Riverton Primary Campus. The board chair has previously written to myself on behalf of the board, arguing the school community's preference that the facility remain dedicated to providing outside school hours care services. And that's all, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chiron. Um, at item four, which is question time for the public, um, at item 4.1, response to previous questions taken on notice. Responses to previous questions taken on notice will be noted in the ordinary council meeting agenda. At item 4.2, which is um, questions from the public, the time set aside for public questions is 15 minutes, which may be extended if necessary. A question must relate to an item listed on the agenda paper. That's tonight's agenda paper. For recording purposes, please state your name and address and then proceed to ask your question from the podium uh, right there in the centre of the uh, room. If an answer cannot be provided at tonight's meeting, the question will be taken on notice and an answer will be provided at the next ordinary council meeting, which is next Tuesday evening. In accordance with policy AD.02, uh, members of the public who have registered their interest to ask questions with the city's administration uh, shall be called upon in the order in which registrations were received. Uh, written questions will therefore precede verbal questions. I open public question time now. It's exactly five minutes to past 6 p.m. I have a, let me see, Mr. Max Zeller from 12 Foreshore Entrance in Wilson. Uh, Mr. Zeller wants to ask a number of questions in relation to the Kent Street Weir precinct plan. Mr. Zeller. Thank you. Yes, I've got three questions here. Okay, the first one relates to the um, proposed 
or alternatives to the car park location. So I'll just read out the question. Um, given the concerns expressed by local residents with respect to the location of the additional car parks directly opposite their homes, can further consideration please be given to the first item, um, locating additional car parking spaces in the area between the proposed community pavilion, main district play area, and the BMX track. If I had a map, I'd show you that area. <laughs> yeah. Um, and or um, at the back of the dog exercise area. There's quite a large area um, there. Um, also related to that point is whether consideration can be given to relocating the entrance to the main district play area. And the reasons um, being th um, that'll improve overall accessibility, particularly for disabled um, children. So, so just ask if you don't have to answer it now, but if that can be considered when you consider oh, it. Mr. Zeller, I'll just ask the director whether or not he may have a response. Um, and if one of a more comprehensive nature is required, we'll certainly see if we yeah. can provide that. Uh, director Warren Bow. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, very happy to take those questions on notice, Mr. Zeller, and sit down with you with a with a map of of the precinct. Um, certainly, the further engagement regarding the location of the car parking is something that we would want to see uh, the community have some input into, and certainly improving access for people with disability into and around the district level playground is something that we would want to engage with the community on as well. So happy to uh, grab your details and take that offline. Excellent. No, we appreciate that opportunity. Um, the second question relates to the cafe expansion plans. Um, as most of you already know, the um, cafe is quite busy during peak periods, um, particularly park run days and community events. And with the anticipated increase of the new playgrounds, and we only have to look at the experience at Riverton Bridge, um, we're concerned, or I'm certainly concerned, and I know the cafe owner is as well, um, that the, the expansion plans of the cafe have been um, deferred till stage five. Um, in light of this situation, I'd ask that urgent consideration be given to better utilising the space behind the existing environment centre in the short term and the veranda area um, um, in the environment centre. I know there's some talk about um, the canoe club also using those facilities as well, but yeah, I think the veranda area and the area immediately behind the environment centre adjacent to the cafe would be a suitable place to extend facilities in the short term. Yeah, so once again, happy to take an answer or if you can consider that when you're looking at your plans. Director Bo, is that already a consideration? Can I just get you to respond? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, certainly the area uh, between the river and the Canning River Eco Centre is the subject of the control of the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attraction. So any expansion of the use of that area would be their domain. But certainly, again, um, I guess like the answer to my first question, happy to sit down with you and look at a spatial plan of the area. Um, the negotiations in relation to the Canning River Cafe are ongoing, uh, and that's a matter of commercial and confidence between the city and uh, the that's operators right. of the cafe. And just to re-emphasise the, the balcony area, I mean, that's probably the easier one. <laughs> if, if, if consideration can be made to giving shared access to that balcony. Yeah, that, yeah okay. Um, the last area relates to the dog exercise area. I mean, when compared to other areas, the precinct, the dog exercise area appears to be disproportionately large. Um, and in my view, and I'm a dog owner, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating, but um, I think better use of much of this area could be um, given to additional parking. That was my first point additional picnic um, shelters and barbecues alongside the community playground. And, and I'll put as an example there, if you look at Ivy Watson playground at um, Kings Park, they make very good use of the area adjacent to the entrance with those facilities. But it, once again, I'm just concerned at the disproportionately large size of the dog area compared to the, yeah, what could be done with the picnic areas around the park. So yeah, if you can just once again, have you take it on notice, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think we'll do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Zeller, okay, for attending this evening. Uh, Mr. Zeller, what I might ask is our governance staff to take your mobile contact number if we don't already have it. I know we've got. Yeah, your I wrote it down, here. but it's um, 0401. I'll just uh, just, oh, so, just, yeah, for yeah, a, just yeah. so I won't get you to. Yeah, no, no worries. Okay. Yeah. If I can get governance, maybe just approach Mr. Zeller at your convenience and just get his uh, contact details. Thank you very much, no Mr. Worries. Zeller, for attending tonight. Yeah, um, on my run sheet here, it uh, says that we've got uh, questions for tonight's meeting from uh, Deanne Dimmick. Is Ms. Dimmick here. Hello, how are you? Would you like to come up and um, ask your question? 
Um, yes, my name's Diane Dimmick, 12 Canning River Gardens, Wilson. So I've submitted my questions prior, but I'll read them anyway. So the first question I have is, in reading the Kent Street Weir precinct plan, I note that the paper refers to the community consultation in 2013 and 2015. With this new plan, which has a number of significant changes to the older versions, is the City of Canning planning to inform and consult further with the community? Uh, Director Bowe. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, we are. Um, we will we'll be informing and consulting with the community and that will take a number of forms, um, such as we'll place signs of the revised plan on the park to inform of the intended works. There'll be a dedicated page on the city's website to, which will be created to inform users of the park of the project's timeline and work scheduling, including regular news updates on the works and their progress and potential that works may affect access to the area from time to time during construction. Updates will also be provided on the city's social media channels. Further engagement on elements such as the car parking, the pump track and the general infrastructure placement will also be undertaken via online surveys and in-person events to allow for local residents and users of the park the opportunity to have further input into the delivery of the precinct plan. These opportunities will be advertised in the local paper on the city's website and through our social media channels. Thank you. Just your next question. Okay. Well, my, ne my next question actually referred to disability access to the playground and some of the facilities. Um, so in reading the Kent Street Weir precinct plan, I refer to the location of the parking areas and the proximity of proposed main district playground, events pavilion, junior nature play space and miniature railway precinct. Has the City of Canning ensured the ease of access from those parking areas for people with disability and their carers within the current guidelines and expectations? Director Bowe. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Obviously, the detailed design process uh, will address the statutory requirements yep. and also our, our obligations as well to provide universal access in and around to the playground uh, and the precinct area generally. Mm -hmm. um, the city is aware that regular users of the area by people with disabilities and wants to ensure that continues uh, to enable this and that the experience for all abilities using the area is enhanced. And the detailed design process may lead to slight alignment changes of paths and car parks to ensure that the expectations are met and reduc reduction in uh, paths of travel and distances of travel, particularly for uh, people with disability. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thanks for coming along this evening. Are there any other questions um, from the gallery? Well, yes, step forward. Don't be nervous. Uh, just your name, <laughs> uh, just your name, and your, your name uh, and your address. Sure, I'm Emily Mancini Johnston, and I live at Six Ethan Court, Riverton. Um, I'll be asking questions with reference to the um, change of lease at Communicare uh, on Riverton Oval. So, to date, there has been no formal consultation with the community to assess the impact of long-term closure of out-of-school. Uh, hours care services for Riverton Primary at the centre at Riverton Oval. Um, does the council plan to um, undertake community consultation and does it agree that further consultation should, should be required prior to any decision being made on the change of lease? Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Gary Adams. So, um, as you're probably aware, we're the landlord for the building, not the service provider. Uh, Communicare was actually the service provider and um, uh, ceased providing uh, the service that you refer to. Um, so uh, no, we haven't done uh, community consultation. We're well aware of um, the views of a number of parents that have contacted us and the school itself. Um, uh, as the landlord, we are um, putting before council what has been requested of us from um, Communicare in terms of uh, their lease on that building and what they um, intend to use it for going forward. Um, so uh, no, uh, we haven't done communication. Uh, we haven't done consultation around the out-of-school um, service itself because we don't deliver that service. Your next question. So Riverton Primary School has grown to be a large campus servicing over 600 students. It is widely acknowledged the provision of childcare and after-school care is an essential area of need in our contemporary society. In making this decision in relation to the treatment of Communicare's present lease, 
does the council feel sufficiently comfortable that they understand the social and economic impacts of this service no longer being provided in connection with Riverton Primary School, nor an alternate service being identified or facility being identified for alternate service providers? I'll, I'll just give you a very quick answer to that. I don't speak on behalf of the council, but I can tell you that the councillors here have received an awful lot of information over the last couple of weeks from the community, and I think the community has been very clear with their messaging. So I think I'm comfortable personally that uh, we're aware of the sentiment, but I'll certainly ask Director uh, Gary Adams just to answer that. Director Adams. Well, I reiterate your comments, Mr Mayor, that um, we're all aware of um, the need for such services and there are a number of um, providers that provide services um, at schools within the city of Canning. Um, most of the our school services are provided on campus. Um, Riverton's um, an unusual circumstance. Um, as I stated, we're not the service provider. We can't force somebody to deliver a particular um, service. Um, but uh, yes, we are well aware of the need for services in that area. Do you have a third and final I question? I do, thank you. Um, Communicare claim a lack of profitability as the driver of the proposed lease change, as well as a change in their business model. Has the City of Canning performed due diligence on Communicare? and the services provided at Riverton to confirm those claims of financial de deterioration and the root cause of that deterioration. Uh, Director, you're able to answer that question? So Communicare have made us uh, aware of uh, their change in the way they deliver their business and the fact that delivering that particular service is no, part, no longer part of their business model. Um, as a landlord, it's not our responsibility or our mandate to go and um, uh, interrogate um, financially um, whether a particular uh, service that uh, a tenant's delivering is, is viable um, financially or otherwise. Um, so, no, we haven't gone to that extent, but they have um, written to us um, saying that their business model has changed and they wish to change the services that they deliver um, in that building and their lease um, in that building currently doesn't permit them to deliver the type of services that um, they wish to. So they have asked us to put before council um, uh, the item that is there tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming along. Uh, any other questions before we close public question time? Yes, would you like to step forward? Just your name and your address, please. Hi, my name is Melissa Spear and I'm from 20 Marjorie Ave in Shelley. I'm also talking about Communicare lease today and I have some further questions with regards to the proposal put forward. Um, as we know, the current building lease with Communicare specifies the permitted use of the facility is for the provision of playgroups, out of school vacation care for children of preschool and primary school age. Now we understand that Communicare have changed their business model, um, but have they actually communicated their surrender of lease already? And has that understanding um, been put forth that they would get a new peppercorn lease under the same arrangement? Uh, Director Adams. So what has been proposed by uh, Communicare is and what has been um, uh, put before council is detailed on page 69. Um, and uh, they are seeking to have a new lease, um, which goes beyond um, their current lease. So their current lease ends in three years. This is a three year plus uh, two additional years. Um, and uh, they're, they're looking at paying $780 a week, uh, a year, um, plus all of the outgoing. So it's all detailed there. Um, the permitted use that they're requesting, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong, it's on page 61, sorry. Um, their permitted use uh, that they're requesting is educational and outreach programs. Um, so they are looking at having a, a lease that, um, uh, allows them to use the building for different purposes. So can I then confirm that the surrender of the lease has not been accepted yet by the council? Uh, Director. So they would only 
surrender the current lease um, if they were, uh, if council agreed to um, the new lease because um, they currently have a lease that goes for um, another three years, I think it is. Um, and um, uh, that in order to accommodate what they want to do, um, they would surrender that lease and have a new lease. So no, they haven't surrendered that lease at this point in time. So building on that, um, when we look at the construction of the building, the intention was as an out of school care facility for Riverton Primary School and its residents. The proposed change moves away from this original intended purpose of the building. Does the council now see that it no longer, does the council no longer view out of school care as a priority for its residents? I'm not sure if the director will be able to answer that question. Director. And lastly, so uh, I will just uh, just stand by just for a moment so, for the director to answer the question. So the per permitted use it, it goes beyond um, out of school care because it was for um, play groups uh, and out of school care. So it wasn't just for out of school care, and uh, um, that building. Um, when it was built, um, uh, Communicare uh, actually got the funding to build that building and build it on city land. That's why we're the, the leaseholder. Um, uh, and that was agreed to back in uh, 2003 by council. Thank you. And just your final question. Thank you. And with the peppercorn lease, does that mean that ratepayers have effectively been subsidising Communicare's rent in the knowledge that Communicare would provide this vital service for after school care and play groups, which they're now wanting to move away from? Uh, Director Adams. So, my understanding was that the peppercorn lease was uh, in recognition that um, they paid for the building uh, initially. So, um, uh, that's why they would have gone on to a, a peppercorn lease at that particular time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For those uh, of you who are here in relation to the matter, in relation to the out of school care, uh, that matter will be debated. So tonight's only just for asking questions. Uh, there won't be any debate by the councillors tonight, but it will be dealt with next week by the councillors. Considering the public, Mr Aldridge, I'll come to you in just a moment. Thank you. Uh, considering the um, public interest in that item, uh, I'd be happy to entertain bringing it forward earlier in the night so uh, we can deal with that uh, if you come along next week. Um, but if you have any further questions, please uh, send them through uh, to me personally or to councillors. Uh, we'll send them through the, to the administration. Uh, but it is a complex legal issue. We're trying to unpick a lease or at least uh, uh, debate a lease that was actually put in place uh, some 20 years ago. So we're just trying to deal with that right now. But that will be dealt with in full and debated next week. Uh, Mr Aldridge, did you want to ask a question? Um, councillors, uh, we've just gone past the 15 minutes for uh, public question time, so we'll extend it for a few minutes. I think, uh, Mr. Aldridge, would you like to go ahead? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and councillors. Um, my question is, if Communicare were just to surrender their lease, um, is it right that there are three other um, people or three other companies which are ready to come in and provide after-school care on the books with the city? How did you hear that there were three other providers ready to step in? Um, I think it was in your documentation that. It's in the documentation. Why? I'm wondering why you're asking the question. But uh, uh, Director Adams, yes, go ahead. So there's probably a number of others that um, may be interested as well. Um, as I understand it, after school care um, can um, be uh, quite profitable to um, uh, providers who are in that space, and uh, um, there may be a number of others that might be interested as well. So. Um, but that would be um, only possible if the building uh, was not currently leased to somebody else. Uh, Mr Aldridge. And is it possible for us to know those three companies or is that confidential? Director. I, I, I wouldn't know who they were um, um, and I wouldn't provide it if I did because they would have approached us, um, uh, I guess. Um, in a, a commercially in confidence um, capacity. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Aldridge. If there's no further questions from the gallery, I'll uh, close public question time.
Thank you very much, everybody. I'll close public question time now. It's 6:25 uh, uh, p.m. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance. If you are here only to ask uh, questions, please feel free to leave. Um, you don't need to hang around. Thank you very much. But feel free to stay around if you'd like to. Uh, deputations. We do have a deputation uh, tonight from um, Sean, um, Sean Mawson regarding uh, item SD021 of 20, and that's a scheme amendment uh, number 29 to town planning scheme number 21. Ms Mawson, thank you very much for coming along. That uh, microphone will magi magically come on. There it is. It just happened. Um, please go ahead. You have um, up to 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Mawson of 86 Gibbs Street, East Cannington. I'll be discussing one of the proposed amendments in Scheme Amendment Number 29 to Town Planning Scheme Number 21, Item SD 02120, in tonight's agenda. Uh, my interest in the amendment called Linear Public Open Space between Thomas Street and Gibbs Street. In the interest of full disclosure, I live close to this public open space. From the plan shown in the agenda, it appears that the public open space will lose a bit of width and be straightened. The text says that this amendment will result in a more regular shaped public open space and adjoining lots, which will result in a more desirable built outcome. This suggests that the lots at 73 Thomas Street and 92 Gibbs Street will be sold for development at some time in the future. From the information given in the agenda, this sounds perfectly reasonable. It is only when you actually look at the site that another opportunity can be seen. At the moment, the whole site is used as public open space. There are some trees on the site and there is enough room for families to kick a ball around or catch a frisbee. Should the proposed amendment be accepted, what residents will see is that they are losing half of their public open space. You can see that there is a footpath that meanders through the site. The building of this footpath was instigated by a year six student at nearby Gibbs Street Primary School, Ethan Big Bins. Ethan collected 101 signatures on a petition which he presented to the then Canning Commissioner, Linton Reynolds, during the September 2014 council meeting. Not only does this footpath have local history attached to it, but its alignment was decided so as to protect the trees on the site from any damage during construction. Unfortunately, the footpath crosses into the lots that the proposed amendment aims to develop. Yes, the footpath can be moved, but doing so destroys local history and places the health of the trees on the site at risk. We should also look at the larger picture. To the west of the lots in question is Mary MacKillop Park. To the east is Gibbs Street Primary School. Further east from the school is a Water Corporation Compensation Basin. And then Ground Lark Park. While not looking like strong wildlife habitat at the moment, it was only nine days ago that the city held a community day on Ground Lark Park to showcase the revegetation plans for the park. Ground Lark Park is to be revegetated with native vegetation and become a haven for wildlife. The public open space between Thomas Street and Gibbs Street, in conjunction with the school gardens and adjacent compensation basin, provides a vegetated corridor between the two larger parks. This satisfies two of the five key objectives listed in the executive summary of the local biodiversity strategy, to increase the viability and resilience of natural areas by establishing buffers and ecological linkages, considering the impacts of climate change, and to increase the distribution and abundance of fauna, including threatened fauna. The executive summary adds that to address the high level of fragmentation, the local biodiversity strategy proposes to implement a revegetation program across the city, particularly in areas identified as local ecological linkages. The local biodiversity strategy details local ecological linkages within the city of Canning. It states, local ecological linkages are identified through this local biodiversity strategy to reconnect isolated natural areas of high conservation values. 
The public open space between Thomas Street and Gibbs Street is perfectly placed to be revegetated and become part of a local ecological linkage. In fact, it sits at the point where two eco local ecological linkages intersect. The local biodiversity strategy also states that East Cannington and Queen's Park have inadequate public open space provisions. While it is acknowledged that additional public open space is provided in other areas of the scheme area to offset the minor reduction in area associated with the amended design of the public open space, that doesn't take into account the urban heat island effect. According to the city's urban forest strategy, East Cannington and Queen's Park are the suburbs in Canning most affected by the urban heat island effect. The strategy states, trees, conservation areas, parks and gardens affect the air temperature of an urban area and cool cities by reducing the urban heat island effect. From what I can see, the additional public open spaces provided in other areas of the scheme area are areas of existing native vegetation that are being saved from being cleared. This vegetation was already doing its bit to ameliorate the urban heat island effect. To have a positive effect on the urban forest strategy and the urban heat island effect, we must plant more trees. And we can only do that if we have the land to plant them on. What I understand when reading the proposal for the linear public open space between Thomas Street and Gibbs Street is that at a place where local ecological linkages intersect, vegetated areas will be reduced in size. In a suburb with inadequate public open space provisions, the existing public open space will be made smaller. And in the suburb with one of the worst urban heat island effects in the city, the cooling effect of green space will be, re be replaced with heat retaining buildings. I believe that the linear public open space between Thomas Street and Gibbs Street should be kept in its entirety. This will enable a better outcome with regards to the local biodiversity strategy in providing an ecological linkage between larger parks. It will keep public open space in a suburb that needs it, and it will help ameliorate the urban heat island effect in one of the hottest areas of the city. My hope is that this proposal is removed from the agenda presented to the Ordinary Council meeting next week. Failing that, I ask that one of the councillors in this chamber will move to amend item SD02120 with the aim of keeping the entire area as public open space. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming along tonight and thank you for delivering your um, deputation. Appreciate it. Uh, councils will move on to item five. There are no items uh, uh, brought forward tonight. Reports of committee meetings, uh, there are none. Uh, reports from the Chief Executive Officer at item uh, seven, uh, there are none. The first uh, matter under um, uh, up tonight for discussion, uh, 7.2, the responsible officer is Director Gary Adams, Director of Canning Community and Commercial. It's uh, CC 054 of 20, the adoption and rescission of governance policies relating to elected members. The recommendation is on page six of tonight's agenda, councillors, and can be seen on the screen now. Do we have any questions? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Just a number, so I'd um, beg your indulgence as I um, go through them. Um, in, on page five, um, part six, the officer's recommendation proposes to delegate the authority of the CEO for the purposes of determining Part 7.2. I'm just, and it's a question that may be, answer, may be able to be answered or not, but I'm just wondering why that would be considered and what would be the benefits given that as elected members we are here to make decisions. Thank you. First question. Just get, um, if you don't mind, I'll just get uh, the director to go through them uh, one by one if he's able to. Um, and obviously, if we need to take those on notice, we will. Uh, Director Adams. So, Councillor Barry, were you referring to the ability of the, um, the CEO to add um, to the authorised events? Is that? Is that? Have you got Have you got a page number in the agenda, or just the yeah, paragraph, five paragraph and, number? Five and six, Mr. Mayor grants uh, grants delegated authority to the CEO to determine Part Seven Point Two of the Council Policy EMO Five events. Yes. Yeah. So that uh, allows the um, CEO to add 
um, an authorised event. So if an event um, was uh, to come up that um, met um, the requirements of um, uh, of the policy and um, uh, was something that it was deemed appropriate for all um, members to be able to attend, um, then that uh, particular event could be added by the CEO without having to come back to council with a full report to add uh, an additional event. So it's only about adding additional events to the non-exhaustive list. list, I think. Okay. Your microphone, Councillor. Sorry about that, Mr Mayor. Um, 5.5 in relation to CM 118 employee training and um, GMO2 uh, gifts, which I think we're being asked to um, rescind. Is there anything that, even if they stay, that will impinge um, in any way on the um, recent legislation changes to the uh, Local Government Act or guidelines? Uh, director, did you want to? Yeah, I, I might just pass that one to um, Karen Cornish, if, um, because uh, she's full bottle on that uh, one. Ms Cornish, you're able to put your microphone on and provide an answer. If not, we can take that on notice. In regards to the gifts policy, um, the changes to the legislation saw notifiable gifts, which were gifts considered between $50 to $300. Um, they're now no longer part of the legislation. So a gift threshold is $300. So if a councillor receives a gift of $300, they must declare it. There are no longer any such thing as a notifiable gift that relates to an elected member. Uh, so that would be in conflict with the policy as it stands. So the notifiable gifts do apply to staff and that's governed by a CEO instruction that is in place at the city for staff. So yes, it would conflict. So that's the CEO instruction you were talking about, that, that is already in place in relation to CM 118? Ms Cornish? The CEO instruction is in place relative to gifts. Um, I I'm not aware of any conflicts in regards to the employee training. I'm probably not the best officer to answer that. Uh, Director Adams. So as um, I think we've discussed previously, um, the reason for rescinding the um, training uh, policy is because it relates um, exclusively to employees um, which fall within uh, the mandate of the CEO. Um, uh, training is determined um, on uh, uh, as needs basis, um, as determined by performance reviews with staff, etc. Um, there are uh, a number of um, procedures in place and CEO instructions that relate to um, how um, that process is delivered. Um, so having a council policy that um, directs how um, the CEO um, essentially uh, manages um, staff and the staff below uh, the CEO in turn manage their staff um, seems somewhat in conflict with um, the roles of the CEO and um, the council. Councillor Barry. Microphone. Under considerations on page 12, Section 2.72 uh, states the role of council is to determine council, uh, determine lo local government policies. I would assume then that um, if it was the will of the council for any of these rescissions um, or amendments to those other policies, if they didn't wish, they could um, say no. Is that correct or not? Uh, Director Adams. Uh, of course, that is the, the recommendation is on page six and requests uh, council to uh, adopt a number of policies and rescinds a number of policies. Um, council could choose uh, to adopt all 
adopt some or adopt none, or rescind all, or rescind some, or rescind none. I'll just maybe I'll just leave it on. <laughs> if that if that doesn't interfere with anything. No, go ahead. Um, on page uh, 45, uh, sorry, on 14 uh, point 45, it says the elected members' feedback provided for consideration the use of alternate wording based on the local government of the tropes policy. It was in relation to childcare and travel expenses. Um, I'm just wondering, would we um, or could I uh, know who who provided that? Because I've never I've never seen um, a statement or a submission by a councillor put in the uh, agenda before. Yeah, so, I'm happy to answer that. That was me. Uh, so when we're asked for feedback, um, I provided feedback and I, I thought there was an opportunity here just to tighten a few things up because currently uh, with the way the childcare particularly is written, um, there's no compulsion. So for anyone, myself included, if I was uh, looking after a child or my own grandchildren, um, my wife, somebody that lives with me, uh, it doesn't have to be a registered um, care provider. Any person, as long as they provide an invoice, and I don't even think it talks about um, ABNs or anything. So I thought there was an opportunity just to tighten that up and also the travel. So I uh, made a point, I think I provided my, sorry about the long-winded reply. Uh. I provided my um, uh, feedback to governance, uh, which was that in the public sector across the nation, there's an awful lot of councils that have much uh, tighter uh, uh, policy in relation to council allowances and we've made some real uh, gains in relation to that in the last couple of years about tightening up a bit um, and I was a little bit astounded myself to see holus bolus it's just been included into the agenda I hadn't expected that to be the case because that was my my feedback um, and it's been uh, yeah and I, I was a bit shocked to see it uh, put in there as a proposed amendment I thought the feedback would either be accepted or not accepted or discussed by council but um, there yeah, you have it. it. That's is. what it is. Yeah. So I, I suppose the, the next question, Mr. Yes. Mayor, and, and I don't want to preempt anything for next week, um, because it does say that should elected members wish to adopt the that wording, I would assume then that if that was going to be the case, that it would maybe you that would um, move that amendment. I've got to be absolutely frank with you. I haven't even thought about it, um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I could. But if that's yeah. not the mood of the room, obviously there'd be no, no point no. doing that. But I'm, and look, it's not a matter of. Um, anything more than I think at the moment with a mood in local government, people just want us to tighten things up. I think that would be an expectation. So I, I was as shocked as you were to see that in yeah. there, but uh, no criticism. And, and just, just from that point of view, I mean, in, in um, point 46, it says the city is of the view the wording provided in that attachment, which is as per the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal Act, um, da, da 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 as it is now, is provide sufficient and equitable clarity on these matters. Is that the officer's view or not? I'll ask uh, Director Adams just to comment on uh, all of the above. Director Adams. Yes, given that the feedback came in after we'd already had uh, a number of workshops and opportunities for councillors to give feedback, um, we included it in this way so that it wasn't missed out and so that councillors knew that it had been raised and um, we put in an example of an amendment that could be used if council so chooses, if a council member wishes to move that amendment. Um, it was just to make things easier on the night if somebody um, does wish to um, include that wording. Our view was, however, that um, we adopted the wording as per the Salaries and Allowances uh, Tribunal um, determination and that uh, we believed that um, that was sufficient and that people would um, generally act in um, an appropriate manner uh, and engage the appropriate people and get the appropriate documentation to substantiate their, their claims. Okay, thank Councilor you. Barry. Um, in, on page nine, I'm sorry to go back, but H says the amount of elected members may be reimbursed for clothing for use at authorised events and authorised functions has been increased too. Now, is it fair enough to say that without preempting a decision, when we did have that SIB, we, we didn't go about making that decision as it seems to 
impute there? Uh, well, we can't make a decision at an SIB, so well, I think the feedback's included in the the feedback is included in the uh, in the item to go to council. It'll be up to council to either accept the decision or make that as a decision by adopting it or amending it or rejecting it. Okay, thank you. Um, in the um, government on page 20 in the governance sections, the statutory compliance says local government act. 599 and 599A, is that requiring of an absolute majority there? Given that it says it's statutory? We're looking at page 20, we're looking at the governance yes. references on the table there in blue statutory compliance. I just thought I'd seen that there was an absolute majority required when it related to 599A. I may be wrong, but so on page 20. Just stand by, um, hey. Councillor, we'll just... Oh, okay. Okay. We'll just take that one on notice and get yeah. back to you. Well, yeah. I'm just reading 599A and it does, it says a local government may decide, but I'm just wondering just how much of that is within that CM, CM1021 because if that's a statutory compliance, I mean, I would assume that as part of it, it would be an absolute majority as well. I think, I think Ms Cornish is directing yep. us to page 17. Uh, paragraph 51 on page 17 under voting requirement and I think if that reference is correct it's talking about an absolute majority. Yes but I don't think I don't think um, CM102 is either 3, 4 or 6. We'll take, we'll, we'll take that on notice if you don't mind Councillor Barry we'll sort that out and get back to you on that. Yep okay um, uh, in CM102 accompanying person Spouse, a partner of the mayor, or the mayor's nominated. Just, just your page number. Uh, Twenty-one, Mr. Mayor. Is to be invited. My question there is that is that an invitation where um, it does ask for the whoever it is and partner. And similarly, on page twenty-two, with the accompanying person. Uh, I'll ask the director to reply, but just to give you just an idea of, uh, so in November last year, I was invited to the Remembrance Day uh, function at the Riverton RSL, just yeah. as example. The invitation was to me personally and to my wife, and wife. Um, uh, but the policy at the time, $60 a ticket, um, I paid for my wife's ticket uh, yeah. and uh, the city paid for mine because even though we'd both been invited, she is my partner, uh, there's no provision in the policy, even though the official invitation was for the mayor and his wife. So I stumped up the $60, which I guess is appropriate, but uh, yes. it yeah. seems, just seems a little bit unreasonable considering how many of these events we get I get invited to. So, uh, sure, sure. yeah. I mean, I suppose, that was just and, and given that explanation, I mean, what I was looking more at is, you know, a situation, and I, you know, I don't think it'll arise, but if there was a local government meeting at, um, for argument's sake, Broome, and you were invited, and the point that I'm making is that should it say with partner? Yeah, I think um, it would be if an official invitation is extended uh, to me and my wife. Uh, you know what, if, uh, if I was trying to uh, add my wife on an invitation to which she was not a party to, that would be obviously improper and you know wouldn't be done. But well, look, we're happy to take any feedback on that. Um, but that was the only example I could provide. It's actually happened, so. Okay. I'll certainly still have to go through because it's a very, very detailed document. But thank you anyway for the thus so, thus so far. No, no problem at all, councillors. Any other further questions before we move on to the next item? Thank you, councillors. We shall move on to CC 055 of 20, which is a Learning City Strategy. The officer's recommendation is on page 51 of tonight's agenda uh, and is on the screen uh, right now. Do we have any questions, councillors? Uh, Councillor Kunza. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, I was just wondering, some of the terminology throughout this document, I find it very hard to qualify or quantify whether we actually achieve the objectives. So I'm just wondering why it's, I guess, I don't know if this is the right adjective, but fluffy. Like, for example, in, in paragraph nine, the four priority outcome areas. Number one is the enabler of resilience and agility. Our community responds to change with agility, overcomes challenges with resilience and capitalizes on opportunities with ingenuity. If I look at all the action outcomes, I'm not quite sure how that will ever be quantified or qualified in the future. I'm just wondering why we're not more direct in, in how we write these things. Uh, Director Adams, if you're able to provide a response, it's a little bit subjective, I know what you're saying, but uh, uh, I guess it's in the eye of the beholder as long as we reach the outcomes. Uh, Director Adams? Yeah, so I'm not sure I would describe it as fluffy, but um, I guess um, we're aiming to, um, so we're saying an enabler of resilience and agility. I think we uh, understand uh, those terms and um, uh, giving a, a bit of context to it by um, what our expectations are in, a, in achieving that. But I can invite um, Dr McQuaid to speak uh, further on uh, how this document was put together because it did go through um, uh, a fair bit of consultation with uh, stakeholders. Uh, uh, Dr McQuaid, just your comments on that. I think it was around the, just the language that's been used and the lack of uh, probably clarity, is it, Councillor, is that what you, you mean? I won't speak for you. Director, uh, Dr McQuaid. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Council Kunz, thanks for the question. I think um, the document itself has gone through a range of consultation with community as well, so hopefully the language does speak. But I think if I'm getting the crux of the question, the question is about how we're going to measure what we're going to deliver if under the terms. And I think under the action plan, which is obviously at this stage just for the initial 12 months, and then we'll develop rolling action plans each year so we can align it to budget, the action plan is quite specific, but importantly, and what we didn't do in the first plan, um, but we're seeking to do in this plan, is through our partnership with um, UWA and a number of other local governments, including the Department of Local Government, um, implement their new um, social impact measurement tool. So we can measure what the hard outcomes are, so the statistics, but we can also start to manage some of the social benefits that are really difficult to measure, and particularly under that enabler of resilience and agility, that is going to be quite a softer outcome area that we want, but the intent is to try and measure that and put this new framework around it. We'll be one of the first local governments to go down that route. So the language, I think, speaks to our community. We haven't had any feedback to say that there's a misunderstanding of it. The action plan hopefully gives the detail to what we're going to attempt to achieve, and we'll have a measurement framework that actually will be able to tell us how we're going, and then that would inform the development of the second year action plan and so on and so forth. Councillor Kunza, anything further? You okay with that? Thank you. Councillor Barry, you had your hand up. Yes, yeah, similarly, um, questions. I don't know I asked a few of you of the night, but I mean, um, I too struggle with, you know, words like analyse intangible impacts. Um, on 21, it says qualitative and quantitative data report on the achievement areas for development and opportunities for the future was produced. Was that part, through you, Mr Mayor, was that part in the attachments or is that something else that we would be likely to see? Dr McQuaid? That was about the first strategy. So that was the work we undertook to review how did we go and how did we achieve to it. So no, we haven't provided that to council. I, I didn't think it was in question what had been achieved under the first strategy. Um, we can pull that. That was just an internal working document. The, the focus of, of my point before was about the new framework that we're going to be delivering, which has only just been developed. So we'll be one of the first local governments to work in that to put a, a much stronger foundation of measurement around the framework from the get-go. Thank Councilor you. Barry. Once again, I mean, that's basically, I, I did see it was LLCS1, but I thought it, it's one of those questions that, you know, you've got to know where you've been to know where you're going. Um, another one was, I think it was on page seven, and it's on there, but I, I can't find it, but it had in relation to digital provide with the elderly and aged and with no tech skills, I mean, what have we got for them, essentially, if anything? Computer Club? Uh, Director, uh, Dr McQuaid. 
thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, are you asking us what we're going to deliver to the elderly who don't have any tech skills? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we do. Um, we do. We already run programs that is about how do you switch on a PC. That's how basic our programs already start. We teach people who've never touched a computer before from the very start of turning it on, opening Windows, looking at an email, navigating it. That's digital literacy kind of 101 that's not unique to Canning. Libraries across the state, across Australia run those sorts of ba very, very basic. Um, senior surfers, those programs are often called. So yes, we do have programs that we can target from that level, but we also want to be able to do the extension and now enable people who perhaps can use their computer quite efficiently, but now want to look at graphic design or doing, you know, creating digital content or coding. It's, it's how do we do that extension across the different needs of our community. One last one, I don't know whether I asked this after in relation to the SIB, Point seventeen on page 53, um, efforts will be made to see external grant funding opportunities and partnerships since, and you can probably take this on notice, I'm sure you will, since 2017, um, what have been the value of grants from those external sources for the that first Learning City strategy? Uh, I think in the email that I provided to elected members last week, I indicated it was in the vicinity of $80,000. $80,000? Okay. Um, yep. Councillor Ponaturo, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm happy to see the, the city learning program, but I think we, when we discussed at the SIB also, uh, my question is how do we, I see this program working around the libraries and like Ross Trotter Family Center, but how, do, how are we going to improve the comms, like the marketing to everyone to know what are the programs available? I know we do, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we, we are developing, have developed, sorry, have developed, just checking their uh, communications plan, obviously around the initial rollout of the new plan, assuming that that's where we go to. Um, but also we've been focusing on um, how do we better promote all our programs and services across our community area through the general website, which we know only reaches some, but also doing that direct mail out to the 350 odd groups and community groups that we have on our mail list now that we can do that direct mail out plus the newsletters. Um, the other thing we've been really conscious on is how do we how do we better tell the story of what we have done, what we can do and how do we get our community telling that story because at the end of the day the stories we want to be hearing and sharing is the impact that it's having for our community. Uh, thank you very much councillors. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, we've looked at the four priority outcomes and, and they're good. Um, however, how confident are we, uh, given the present financial environment, that uh, there may be some budget, is there any risk of budget creep? Because uh, some of the language, it it's, uh, could be interpreted quite broadly or it could be interpreted quite narrow. I'm just concerned from the fiscal point of view, is that are we going to be able to perform whatever we do within our constraints? Dr. McQuaid. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm quite confident that we will. And one of the reasons we have moved to a model of developing a year on year action plan is so that we can align the action plan with the annual budgeting process. So we will only work to what the budget is that is approved through that process each year. This year, everything that's in the action plan is in the current operating budgets for the business areas. So we're not looking to come back to council for any additional funds. And as we've said, we will continue to seek external grant funding to hopefully offset some of the costs. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McQuaid. Uh, let's move on. Thank you, councillors, to uh, CCO 56 of 20. Uh, that's the discussion in relation to the new lease request uh, subject to the surrender of existing lease for Communicare at uh, Riverton. Uh, Councillor Kunza has already declared an impartiality interest in this item. The recommendation is on page 57 of tonight's uh, agenda. Director um, Adams is the responsible officer. Uh, Councillors, do you have any questions? Uh, Councillor Spencer Teo. Um, with the policy statement of the Tenancy Management Policy BR01, um, it states that it provides the lease for the city's facilities to meet the current and future needs of the community. Um, 
I'm just wondering what the definition of the community is. Is that the local community, the city canning, canning community or community groups within a community? Can I get some clarification, please? Director Adams, do you have an answer to that one? So we use community uh, quite a bit, don't we? Um, look, um, in that form, it's um, needs that are um, coming from the community. So I don't think we, we um, uh, limit it to any particular geographical area other than the city of Canning. Councillor Spencer Teo. Um, in that case then, what consultation or have we just taken Communicare's word for it that there is a need for the proposed activities that Communicare are proposing in that building um, that basically meets the current meets the current and future needs of the community. Uh, Director. Yeah, so um, when Communicare put the proposal to us, I, I can read exactly what they put to us. Communicare would like to propose a new lease agreement on the property at Noongar Way, Riverton, to primarily support no more than 15 people at any one time, students and staff, to carry out approved alternative education programs for these high need uh, students, most of which are diagnosed with autism. To make the space fit for purpose, we look to invest up to $30,000 and our intention is to engage design and special needs fund space specialists to support this approach in a creative, imaginative, safe, friendly teaching and learning environment with a common theme of well-being. Um, it goes on, if you'd like me to read the rest of it, but um, I guess, you know, Communicare have um, they are a long-term tenant. They have a good understanding of um, community needs. Um, they believe this is a need that needs to be um, met um, and um, they do have um, uh, a waiting list for people to uh, access such services. Uh, Councillor Spencer Taylor. Um, just noting in the report here that um, these the children that will benefit from this service um, currently attend the Kenwick facility. Are there any um, families in the city of Canning who require this service or who already attend this service or are on the wait list? Not sure if we would know that. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that autism is limited to a specific geographical area. I don't think we have that detail. Um, can I just ask a question uh, before, um, just in the page 56, the final paragraph there just uh, talks about um, as there are no allowances for subleasing in the current lease, this facility will sit idle until the end of the lease in October 2023. That seems somewhat um, unequivocal. Um, can I just get you to comment on that, Director? Uh, and also, uh, if Council were to not accept the recommendation, what would then be uh, the next steps here with this process? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so yes, I'll, in the final report um, that goes before council, I'll reword that because it should actually uh, be may sit because there are um, a number of options that could be further explored if council doesn't um, agree to uh, what's put before them, what the proposal is currently from Communicare. So what we would do um, and um, taking on feedback that we've already got, we um, will uh, approach Communicare and um, see uh, what other uh, scenarios could um, be of benefit to uh, the group of people that um, they are looking to um, provide services to and perhaps um, accommodate some other um, purposes as well. So we would go back to um, further negotiations with them, given that they currently um, still have a lease that is in place. Thank you. Councillors, any other questions? Councillor Kunza. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, just following on from Councillor Spencer Tiro's uh, questions, uh, just clarifying. So in terms of the community need, um, the city is not aware of what the definitive community need is, is that um, within the South East Corridor or within the City of Canning? Um, or is there a proposed catchment area for this outreach program? Uh, Director Adams. I'll take that on notice and uh, put that to Communicare. 
Councillor Collins, anything further? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just clarifying, given that the actual uh, Communicare Academy was a purpose-built state-of-the-art facility only built four or five years ago, I'm just wondering what it means in the report that um, they would that the 10 to 12 children would benefit from an improved environment in this facility. Why is it improved potentially in Riverton as opposed to the state-of-the-art facility in Kenwick? Our director. Um, because that school is a traditional institutional directional design with paved quadrangle and is located in a busy intersection. The school has no green space, respite space, specialised alternative education spaces for our higher need students, um, especially NCCD level 03 and 04s. Uh, we have higher need students that we need to engage with sitting at 10 to 12 at any one time. So it's um, uh, intended to be a different space than what they already have. Councillor Kunza. And just um, has the city or is the city aware, aware whether Communicare has investiga investigated other buildings? Um, that is, is this the most appropriate building in the most appropriate suburb? Or is it simply that Communicare has a lease over this one so they're wishing to repurpose it? Director. Um, my understanding is that um, given that Communicare uh, essentially built this facility and um, have operated it as a uh, tenant for 18 years, that um, uh, they believed that uh, this was uh, an appropriate space to provide, um, continue providing services out of, although a different range of services to what they have in the past, and that um, uh, they would need to also invest another $30,000 to get it to uh, the specifications for which they um, which they require to deliver the uh, services that they're proposing to deliver out of it. Thank you. Director, can I just ask, um, is there any indication from Communicare that they're intending to present a deputation uh, on the matter or would it be appropriate to invite them to do so? or? Uh, we had a discussion along those lines. Uh, yeah, um, I was um, um, fairly sure that they um, would uh, uh, want to come and uh, do a deputation, and I'm thinking that they may wish to do that at the OCM. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll ask them and invite them um, to do that. Thank you. Councillors, any other questions before we move on? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Uh, a couple of those, um, I think you read out the previous one to Councillor Kunz, was that part of the communications of Communicare with the city? Uh, Director? Yes, so that was um, provided uh, by their Director of Education, Employment and Training Services. Okay. Councillor Barry? Thank you for that. No, I only say that because, I mean, and I'll thank the CEO for the email this morning, but I mean, given the fact that you're quite prepared to um, say that tonight, 592, I think, um, gives me the right to check that information, but I will respond tomorrow morning with some other um, facts from previous inquiries in relation to it. The other question I wanted to ask is, prior to um, COVID, do we know how many children from Riverton Primary attended that out of school camp? Do we know the enrolment numbers uh, in previous years, Director? And if not, can we find we out? We probably do, but I haven't got them to hand, so yes, I can, can we find take, that that on, take that on notice, Councillor Barry. Um, on page 58, number 10, uh, there is a potential, and this is in line with if, I suppose, a council agrees to uh, Communicare's request there is a potential for the facility to accommodate multiple services. However, such an arrangement may impact on any proposed building works and costs associated with accommodating multiple services from this site. The type of agreements on offer to the potential tenants would need to be reviewed and the facilitation and practicality of running multiple services that would need to be addressed. Now, I know the city sort of wishes um, through leases to have those multi-services, but I mean, does that mean that if Communicare gets it, they can sub-lease it? 
or sublease uh, pa parts of the building? Director. So uh, what, is th what that is attempting to say, and I'll um, clarify uh, some of that in, in the final report, I guess, was that uh, if, um, we, if they are not granted the exclusive use for the purpose um, which they've requested, then um, there is still the opportunity for the city to um, negotiate with them and um, potential uh, other tenants or sub-tenants um, and reach some agreement on delivering um, uh, both their service and other services out of that facility. Um, however, given that they have a current exclusive use lease, it would require negotiation with them. Okay. Um, yes, Barry? On page 63, 29, the matter has been discussed in detail with the Canning Community and Commercial Program, which with detailed consideration to the community feedback. And this is probably just in relation to a question earlier this evening by one of the people from Riverton. When we say Canning Community and Commercial Program, is that's your division and with detailed consideration to community feedback. If we haven't consulted, how, do, how will we go about getting community feedback? Uh, Director. So I think it's well, I think everyone's well aware that um, there's been emails sent to councillors, there's been yeah. emails sent to staff, there's been uh, phone calls received by staff, there's been discussions with uh, the school principal. Um, so all of those things have been considered. Um, and I guess, you know, um, uh, we also uh, looked at what other schools in the area do, and um, I think there was six or seven uh, schools um, within um, a fairly close radius to um, Riverton that were providing um, after-school care in their own facilities using a third-party provider. Um, and I think um, we didn't think that that was uh, beyond um, the expectations of um, uh, the city and parents to expect that um, a school would would do that. So Councillor Barry, that question there, you believe that the surrounding out of school cares could absorb those students that are in question, given well until we find out the number. Uh, director, so no, uh, I think our. our um, point was that um, this is a unique circumstance where um, the out of school care is provided in um, a facility that's not uh, on the actual school grounds, whereas um, the normal model is, uh, and the most, um, uh, I guess, prevalent model is that uh, schools provide um, for after school service care um, on their own grounds in their own facilities. Um, so um, there was um, a discussion with the principal about that. The pr principal um, indicated that the school was at capacity and that they couldn't accommodate after school care on their own school grounds. Councillor Barry. So, so then is it fair to assume that the principal would say that because for the last amount of X amount of years, Community care have been providing the service, and basically, for want of a better word, are we not just pulling the carpet out from underneath them? No, I'm not sure, afraid what I. So I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure we're doing anything because it was a service provided by Community Care for uh, that particular school uh, out of one of our facilities. So nothing that we have done has impacted at all on the ability of Communicare to deliver that service. One last question, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, Communicare had the lease on a building in across the road from the Hillview shops where the new multi-cultural centre is? Uh, Hillview, in Bentley. In Bentley. 
is that they did have a lease on it. And they left that vacant for five years or more? Uh, I'll have to check how long it was vacant for, but um, uh, yeah, they handed it back, handed back the lease some time ago. Can you find, can you find that, please? I'd like to know. And I mean, the other question is that uh, could it, could, is it a possibility that if the, um, the council was of a mind not to progress with this, that um, there could be a deputation either by the mayor and or the officers seeking them to surrender that lease? Because that's about the only way that I can see out of this. Uh, we can only sit, ask them to do that. There's no compulsion yes, I'm not, yeah, I'm to not do saying that. We're forced. Is that what you're saying? So, I'm saying, you know, yeah. if, if council is, is of a mind not to accept the proposal, and it's going to sit there for three years. Yeah, that'd be the. Um, so when I asked earlier about what would be the next steps if we didn't mm. support it, I think that would be it. That we would probably, or the administration would negotiate with Communicare and try and find a position. And hopefully they would want to be uh, good citizens. And perhaps if they weren't going to use the building for the next three years, they would look to surrender the lease. But that would be preemptive. But I expect that that would be a course of conduct that would happen if that decision was taken by council. Exactly, Mr. Mayor, but a bit more eloquent than I. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Ponoturai. Thank you, and I'll come to Councillor. Thank Spring. you. Just following on um, Councillor Barry's earlier question about subletting, but looking at the old um, tenancy agreement 2.19, so that that's not to mortgage or charge or encumber nor sublet. Just want to clarify from Director Adams. So the 2.19, it says not to sublet. So I think we're quite clear in the report that. One of the reasons why this has been brought to council is that um, regardless of whether Communicare uh, wanted to engage a third party provider to continue providing the after school care uh, in that facility, they can't do it under the existing lease um, because there is that um, uh, clause in there that says that they uh, cannot sublet. Thank you. Councillor Sweeney. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so um, to cut to the chase, so I'm quite clear about this. Essentially, this is just about a lease contract between the leasee and the leasor um, with no variation in that lease and there's no special conditions that should be probably included in that lease. There is just nothing but a standard lease in place in line with common law agreements. And the only options that are open to us right now as I see it after speaking and listening to what's been going on, just confirm this for me, is that the current business model that is being proposed by Communicare doesn't fit um, with continuation of the services that was originally provided. So the only way that I can see some sort of resolution with this would be one, and correct me if I'm wrong, so I've got an understanding, would be to, and I think it's been discussed, some form of mutual agreement to terminate the lease and vacate the premises to allow us then to re-advertise for a fit for purpose business that will address the community's needs and concerns, which has adequately been communicated this evening. Or, and two, wait until 2023 when the lease terminates and then we can re-advertise that building for the purpose but between now and 2023, that service won't be provided by Communicare. Did I Director Adams? ask that? So Communicare no longer have a licence to provide that service. They ceased providing it earlier this year. Um, uh, there are a number of options that um, could play out over time. Um, What's before you is Communicare's preferred option for the use of that building for the next three years plus two years. Um, this is what their business model um, and their service delivery model um, now, um, uh, this is what they want to do under their current business model. Um, if this is not supported by council, then we'll go back to Communicare and continue negotiations with them um, and bring um, something back to council that um, either um, uh, 
uh, does what you say and um, has an agreement that um, the lease is terminated or um, continues on um, or develops uh, a new lease with different um, potential uses or um, multi-uses. So there's a range of options that can be um, played out in the future. It's not um, uh, this or uh, termination or sit idle. And I will amend the report to make that clear. Yeah, thank you for that. I, look, I, I do think it's very worthwhile for us to go and re-establish negotiations with Communicare in regards to what's been discussed this evening and just see whether or not there is room to move um, from their point of view. So that's all I'll say. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, would you mind, um, I might ask you to take the chair for five minutes. I just need to um, take a quick break. And do, did you, you're happy to do it from over there? Well, I've, got a, I've got a run sheet that you need to take over, so um, I'll bring that over to you. It might be easier for you to come over here, actually. About five minutes here. Yeah. No, that's right. I'll get just, uh, and I'll just, uh, just to pause just for a moment, thank you, and then we'll go to Councillor Barry and then uh, Councillor Bain. Yeah, if I just get the um, Deputy Mayor to take my chair for five minutes, just excuse us for one. Um, who is, is it, Catherine Barry? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, just a question through you to Director Adams. If Communicare have let their licence lapse, is that not a breach of their contract in relation to the purpose of what they're there for? Because they certainly can't go back in now if it's lapsed. No. Um because uh, they haven't breached any um, part of the lease. Um, they, the lease permits them to uh, use it for play groups or after school care. Oh. And um, they've chosen not to do the after school care. Um, uh, therefore, they don't need a license to do the after school care. If they were doing after school care and didn't have a license, then uh, I think that would uh, constitute, or well, potentially constitute, a breach of the lease. I'm trying, to I'm trying to understand because the licence would say to them, "You are licensed for 50 students." When when did they decide to let their licence lapse? And how could they ever think about going back in there now as an out-of-school kid? Because so, if it's lapsed, they'd have to go through the whole process again. So I'll be very clear. Their business model now does not uh, does not include providing after-school care. So they're not going back into after-school care. So they do not need a license. They let the license lapse after lapse after they finished providing that service. Uh, Councillor Bain. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So just in addition to uh, Director Adams' comments, so in the other considerations or risks section for the officer, officer recommendation uh, being declined by the Council, the uh, consequence or likelihood no, would no longer be almost certain, as in the premises um, lying idle for well, to the rest of the uh, lease is finished. Thank you. Um, yeah, if we can't reach an agreement, um, then that's a possibility. Um, but yeah, I'll have another look at that risk and see if it needs to just be reassessed. Is there any other questions for this? Uh, Councillor Spencer to you. Is it my it was my understanding correct that um, Communicare would transport the enrolled children who are already attending Kenwick to this new facility, or would the parents of those families drop those children off? Um, I don't know. I have to take that on notice. Uh, Councillor Potter. 
Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> so do we have many leases like this that have the peppercorn rents that don't have a strong clause in there that requires them to keep doing their service that they're doing, which is why we give them the peppercorn rent? So um, there's a number of old leases that um, uh, have particular uh, clauses in them that we um, no longer use and we use, uh, I guess, more contemporary um, clauses. Um, that's what that tenancy policy that we brought in a couple of years ago uh, was designed to do, to try and standardise some of those clauses and standardise some of the leases um, so that um, we didn't have um, significant um, variations from particular um, directions that uh, Council had uh, determined. Um, as I stated, um, our understanding is that this lease was a peppercorn lease because Communicare built the building. Is there any further questions on this matter? Uh, Councillor Barry? Just in relation to what um, Councillor Tia was saying there, um, and your answer, if if counts if Communicare did take over um, or were awarded that new lease with the options, maybe could they could they in turn then say that that thirty thousand dollars that they're putting in would also entitle them at some stage or another to an extra twenty year lease? Uh, because, no, of, because of the import. Well, what, what's in the report are the key terms of the lease. So the key terms of the lease includes um, the, uh, what, they, what they've asked for. So um, three years plus a two year option. Uh, and that's, um, that would be subject to them putting in the $30,000 to um, bring uh, the facility to the standard uh, and requirements that they need to deliver the service that they're going to deliver from it. And the hypothetical, because that's the 21, 21 year lease came about because they said they put a substantial amount of money in. Now, I'm just relying on your expertise to say to me, is that a possibility? Let's be clear, the 21 year lease came about because council agreed to it. So council is now being asked to agree to a three year plus two year option. So that's all. Um, whatever happens after that is uh, um, something that the next council will have to deal with. If there's no further questions on this matter, we'll move to the next matter, which is CC 05720. New lease, Willington Football Club. You can find that on page 65 of your agenda. Is there any questions for this matter? Councillor Barry. Uh, I just noted in the um, page 61 of the outgoings for the Communicare, their rates uh, would be 852 subject to concessions and in the Willington Football Club, the minimum rates are 852, but it doesn't say they um, would be subject to any concessions. Are they not a sporting group or a not-for-profit that would be entitled to that? So they're um, they're not entitled to uh, a concession or exemption. However. Um, Council has a policy that would enable them to apply for it um, and be um, granted it. Um, Communicare, because of their um, charitable status um, and the fact they were using it for um, a, an education facility, would be entitled to a rates exemption under um, the particular section of the Act that deals with those types of exemptions, so that should actually say exemption rather than concession. Um, uh, the Willand Football Club may be entitled to a waiver as determined under um, the council policy on waivers for sporting groups. 
but they would have to apply for that, would they? Yes. And it would be like, well, not, well, I won't say likely because we don't know, but that would come that would come before council. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, councillors. Thank you to the deputy mayor. Um, I'm now uh, back in the room. Uh, where are we up to? Uh, we're still discussing Willett and Lease, or we haven't yet moved on to that? Just started. Yeah. Just started. Uh, Councillor Kunza. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, with respect to the outgoings, um, does each leaseholder as part of that facility pay the same, or is it the total outgoings divided by the individual leaseholders? Director. So we only have one lease. So the lease grants exclusive access. Mm -hmm. So whoever is the lessee. Um, pays the um, outgoings. Uh, sorry, Kunza. just to clarify, is this not the? Sorry, the I tell you, it's very hard to read some of these um, maps and so forth because you zoom in, you can't read it. But it's the the middle blue room, isn't it? What's used to be called the blue room in the middle of the facility. Director. Uh, why? Mine's in black and white because I'm reading off a printer. Uh, but, but just on that, um, uh, Director, this has been raised um, a, a lot of times in the five years I've been on council. The, um, the quality of the illustration in the report, uh, there's absolutely no point having a legend there because uh, you, you can't read a word of it. Um, and it's quality and resolution so poor you can't you can't read any of it in printed form. I'll get um, the report. I'll clarify in the report the exact area that they're leasing. We'll get some clarity on that for you, Councillor Kunza. Anything else, Councillor Kunza? Thank you. Anybody else? Before we move on, thank you, councillors. We'll move on to the next item. Next item is uh, CC058 of 20. Uh, it's a light, late item. It's the uh, monthly financial report of September 2020. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Barry. And of course, it's on page two of the late item circulated. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, once again, this is another one where, I mean, the, the wording is, is very scratchy. Um, I'm just wondering because I, I did read somewhere within the report that it was it said um, that it was uh, the late adoption of the budget. Now I don't think we had a late adoption of this budget. Is that correct? Did we not this, do that during the 30th or something? Uh, director, it was the end of July when we adopted the budget. And uh, look, uh, uh, and just one question. I mean, and, and it's, it's a perennial one for me because it, it keeps we talking about positive variations of one and one and a half, one point seven million, three point seven, and a lot of the time. Well, it does provide uh, uh, and some somewhat of an explanation, pretty um, short in in some ways. But I mean, given the fact that we're we're basically only into October, I'm just wondering what. What are we talking about timing? I mean, how can, how, can, how can we have timing three months into the budget? Uh, Director Adams. Yeah, so um, this early in the financial year, given that um, you know, we've only adopted the budget in um, July. There are going to be um, significant uh, timing differences because we try and estimate when things are going to happen, um, and they don't always happen that way. So um, we list them as timing differences. So, um, for example, um, when you look at the economic services um, and the positive variance there, it's because all the revenues raised at one particular time, um, and that. Um, uh, um, um, then it is throughout the year, so it creates that that variance up front um, because it's compared to what the the yearly figure is. Um, so we do need to do better at profiling the budget to get the um, 
the expenditures um, and revenues into the right months. Um, and uh, that is something that we are working on to try and do better with um, profiling those and pro projecting when those particular expenses and revenues occur so we don't create these sort of variances that uh, skew things. Yeah, and, and the reason I ask that question is because with the, the rate freeze and all those extra monies that we are bringing forward, I mean, it just looks a little bit wonky for me that three months in, we've got timing differences. So I wonder how if, if it's going to get worse or not when we end up with all that extra money and projects that are supposed to be done. Uh, director? So if we identify something that um, isn't going to occur, then that will be listed as a permanent difference, not a timing difference. So um, we're still expecting that um, uh, these things will still occur. Um, it's just that um, the revenues and expenditures haven't exactly um, lined up with um, uh, where we expected them when we put the budget together. So um, when we do the budget review, which we're doing at the moment, um, we'll pick up a lot of those uh, and you won't see them um, for the rest of the year because we'll pick up them and profile them uh, differently in the budget. And just one other question because I, I did notice somewhere else and I, I think I spoke to Director Bo about this once before in relation to I think some future road works on Walshpool Road down towards the new football stadium where we're now no longer going to do that. It's been suspended for, I think there was some underground stuff. And I'm just wondering, in the previous year coming up to a budget, do, does the city not have consultants or people on board that would provide um, some geotechnical reports for up and coming projects like that, given the fact that we found that um, contaminated soil in the, the last one. Thank you. Uh, Director Bow, are you able yeah, to answer? Thanks, Mr Mayor. I'm happy to revisit uh, that information I provided about uh, Welshpool Road at Murray and Furness. Um, the issue in relation to the funding and the imp impacts on the budget is that we'd already received our grant funding to uh, undertake that project. So when we cancel the project, we need to refund the, the money and resubmit the project for future funding down the track, but I'll, I'll revisit some of the explanation on that one, Councillor Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, Councillor Ponotero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Director Adams. Just quickly, if you're doing the budget review now, if um, if you move the, any of the major item, or if we, if we think we need to reprioritize, uh, obviously, would you, would you bring that to the our attention? Will that come? Or, or any particular amount, would that come to us? Thank you. Just in a word? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Spencer Tia? Just on um, page 27 of the warrant listing, um, I've noticed a few months back um, with, with this this reporting period, we've spent 22,000, 22,500 on web design. A couple of months back, it was about 33,000. Um, so we spent in excess of $50,000 on web design. Do we not have someone in-house to do that? Uh, Director Adams. Can you tell me the EFT number that you're referring to, please? 027038, about three quarters of the way down, ID Consulting, page 27. So um, there was a specific project to do with um, the uh, Connect uh, in Canning uh, website. Um, and I'm thinking that that's probably related to that. Um, uh, we do have, uh, we do do a lot of our um, web um, stuff in-house. In we do have uh, an in-house person that is um, leader of digital experience that um, uh, does a lot of work on the website. There is some stuff that um, we need to 
go external for. Um, this was a particular project that um, we went external for, but a lot of it is done in-house by our own um, people. Um, I believe there was a query the 33,000 um, and that was explained that that was the connecting canning a couple of months ago. So would it be correct in saying that we've spent over $50,000 on the connecting canning website in, in external consultants? Did you want to take that on notice, yeah. Um, Director? Yeah, I, I think that was the, the right figure, but I will get back to you on exactly what those figures were. Thanks, councillors. We might move on uh, from the financial report and we will move on to um, SD 021 of uh, 20, that's scheme amendment number 29 uh, to town planning scheme number 22. Uh, number 21, apologies. Um, any questions on that before we move on? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. On page 76, number 9, I think it relates to 146 Treasure Road. Um, I just want to know it, it, who, who owns that block because if we're taking that out of the TPS scheme, I mean, that's a windfall for somebody. Um, any reason why? Uh, Director Bride. Uh, yeah, through Mr Mayor. Which uh, particular uh, paragraph are you talking to? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm paragraph 9. Paragraph 9, wasn't it? Uh, 146 Treasure, I mean, it goes from the uh, microphone. Oh. open space to basically just two big blocks. Uh, yeah, three of me. Yeah, that particular cul-de-sac uh, on Treasure Road, given uh, the Queen's Park local structure plans come into play, um, there's no need now for that, for that road uh, to be provided. Um, to uh, connect or to provide a development outcome because multiple dwellings will be the development outcome on that particular property. Uh, in terms of that POS provision, they'll still need to provide that amount of POS as part of the development, so that's not lost. Right. Um, so there's no loss of POS as part of this proposal. So the t TPS still has to be paid on that, the remainder of that That's block. right. So the, so the owner would either have to provide POS uh, in kind or they'll have to contribute the relevant POS contribution. Okay, so uh, just one other question um, in relation to the TPS. Is that paid at the amalgamation or subdivision or at the, um, when it's a, an approved DA value? Uh, through Mr Mayor, I understand it's the, uh, at, at the time of subdivision clearance and the oh. subdivision goes through before they get uh, clearance from the city, they have to make their contribution to uh, that scheme. And one other question I did have was on, um, Linear public open space, Thompson Gibbs, but I think um, that's been covered with the deputation and some answers. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kunza, and then Deputy Mayor uh, Jacobs. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, to Director Bride, um, as just referenced by Councillor Barry, um, Ms Mawson earlier provided a deputation on the linear public open space between Thomas Street and Gibbs Street. Just wondering if um, Director Bride's able to comment on what was raised or whether we'll be able to receive some commentary between now and the um, OCM. Uh, Director? Through Mr Mayor. Yeah, what I'll do uh, under the AB comment is I'll um, ensure there's an aerial with the land ownership uh, shown clearly. Um, as uh, identified in the deputation, uh, the, the city owns land that is a, lot, a fair bit larger than the actual public open space designation in Town Planning Scheme 21. And that land is designated under, our, under the city's adopted land utilisation plan for further investigation. So there's no commitments around you know, further developing the site at this stage. It's under investigation. But certainly I think uh, what I'll do is I'll provide that aerial with all the the relevant land parcels uh, so the city can, or the council can get a better appreciation of uh, what the land holdings uh, involve. Uh, there's, there's, I guess, three options uh, for council. One is to um, allow, the app, or allow this amendment to go out to advertising uh, as per the officer's recommendation. Another option would be uh, to uh, not support that particular change. And I think the third option that um, uh, was presented was uh, the city consider um, widening out the public open space to the full areas of its ownership, which would probably add another 60% uh, into the POS area. But of course, that comes with a potential, if it was ever looked at to be developed, a potential loss uh, of that uh, land for any other purpose other than public open space. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll 
I'll put it together a summary, uh, a bit more clarity around that particular issue for the uh, OCM agenda. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, if can you talk a little bit more about the financial impacts, if uh, in either either case, if we were to support or not support, um, in financial in impacts in, in terms of the city for us. Director, can that be included in the um, information that you provide? Yes, certainly I can do that, Mr. Mayor. Okay, you're happy with that, Deputy Mayor? Uh, uh, no further questions. We might uh, move on. Thank you very much. Move on to the next item then, which is um, SD022 of 20, the adoption of Queen's Park Local Structure Plan Amendment 2. The recommendation is on page 83 of tonight's agenda and is on the screen right now. Councillors, are there any questions in relation to that? Councillor Bain, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got a number of questions on uh, this item. Uh, would it please be possible to have a satellite map showing where the proposed laneways are to be built? And that will provide some context as to the existing property and uh, infrastructure in the area, if that's possible, please. Uh, Director? Uh, yes, certainly. Can I say that this is for the Queen's Park uh, local structure plan area? No, for uh, the city. Oh, the city, city centre. Centre. City centre. Yep. Thank you. Your next question. Uh, so, in the schedule of modifications, uh, number 25, so how will the change of allowing buildings closer to the footpaths along Albany Highway impact the Albany Highway access network and the right of carriageway network in the precinct? What page are you referring to there, Councillor Bain, in the agenda? I think you might have jumped an item. Uh, we're on, um, yeah, we're on the Queen's Park one at the moment. Uh, that's all right. We'll just back up the truck a moment. We'll come back to you as soon as we get to that. Councillors, before we finish, are there any other uh, questions in relation to the Queen's Park local structure plan before we move on? Councillor um, Barry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Bain, gather his thoughts. <laughs> um, on page 84, uh, there's a, quite a number of deletion requirements that are already um, covered in, S, well, so it says in SPP 7.3. The question I've got written here is that, um, R, is this the government one, is it more prescriptive um, and could developers um, uh, appeal any city conditions to the to the WAPC, but in saying that, I'm not quite sure whether it makes any sense about the WAPC, but are the conditions of the SPP73 more prescriptive than what we already have? Uh, Director Bride. Uh, through Mr. Media, the main uh, driver of this amendment was to ensure there was no duplication. Uh, when we developed the Queen's Park Local Structure Plan, we, we actually borrowed um, some of the content from the draft, SPP 7.3. Yeah. Then that went through consultation and a number of things changed. So the majority or all of those requirements uh, for deletion are already covered under SPP 7.3 and they're appropriately detailed um, and they're consistent across metropolitan Perth. So uh, a developer that uh, you know, develops in Melville, develops in Canning, is operating off a very the same guideline in relation to apartments. All right, so that was the question. I don't know if you answered it. I mean, uh, is, how many others uh, local governments do we know? I mean, if you say a number, then that's sufficient. Um, are doing the uh, the same um, with their planning and going with the SPP 7.3. Uh, yeah, through Mr. Mayor, a number are because uh, they have adopted their structure plans um, prior to SPP 7.3 coming in. Uh, a number of structure plans uh, adopted um, don't go into the level of detail that we went into, um, so maybe the changes for, for some other local governments aren't as significant. Ours went into a lot of urban design uh, criteria and now that's picked up in SPP 7.3. Uh, we want to reduce the complexity and reduce the length of the documents and make sure that where there's a duplication we remove that so that anyone using the document um, is quite clear on what is required. And just one last one, uh, I did recall reading um, and I presume it's until this is gazetted where it does, it does say in relation to some of the two stories as opposed to um, group dwellings there are gaps. So does that mean that 
people can still build group dwellings? Director. Within their, within that lot? Yeah, so th there's a number of precincts under the uh, structure plan. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> those precincts that are close to the train station, no way. there are restrictions on group dwellings, so you have to build multiple dwellings in those core precincts. Uh, as you move out into the residential frame precincts of the structure plan, you can have group dwellings. Uh, but what is consistent even in the in the outer frame is a two-storey minimum. Um, that was one of the or the only submission we got was a landowner that didn't particularly like that aspect. That aspect, that aspect wasn't part of the advertised changes, but certainly um, there is scope under the structure plan to consider, uh, you know, variations to those requirements. So it's not a blanket rule. We we do look at variations uh, if, so if they're appropriate. 117 Mill Street yeah. was that in the railway precinct, or is that one of those further out? That's in the outer precinct. I think it's the residential frame precinct. So that didn't have. So you, can, so you can build group dwellings in that one, but right. there's a two-storey minimum. Um, so that was the issue that was raised by the objector or through the submission that they were concerned about that requirement for two-storey. Obviously, it's more expensive to go two-storey than it is single-storey. Um, they've got no development plans on the books at the moment, but certainly that's something that they raised as, as an issue for them potentially in the future. So is, is, is there a possibility in those outer areas that people can go make an appeal to either SAT or the WAPC to build group dwellings but not out of two-storey two height? Uh, yeah, group dwellings is allowed in those outer precincts, so there's no issue with group dwellings, so that can, that can happen in those outer precincts. In terms of uh, you know, whether it's a single versus two-storey, we'd have to look at the merits of the case. Um, you know, for example, you know, we have looked at some variations where the two-storey component was applicable on the streetscape, and then as you went back into the further into the lot, you could go down to a single-storey component. Not because of the streetscape, you still get a, a nice presentation from a streetscape perspective, but there is some flexibility there. So we have looked at uh, you know site-by-site -site, uh, situations where um, we can accommodate uh, landowners' requests as long as the I guess the amenity in the streetscape is uh, protected. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor. We might move on to the next item. Councillor Bain's got a number of questions, unless there's anything else. Uh, thank you. We'll move on to um, ST023 of 20, the adoption of Kenning Activity Centre Plan Amendment 1. Councillor Bain, your first question regards to the satellite um, image. I think that was addressed, and your second one was in relation to buildings being built closer to the footpath or something. Would you like to go That's ahead? That's correct. Thank you, Mr Mayor. No, I appreciate uh, that Director Bride's going to um, provide a satellite map. Um, that answers my first question. That's fantastic. So just with the change of allowing buildings being built close to the footpath along Albany Highway, how will that uh, impact the Albany Highway Access Network policy? And will that impact the number of car parking bays that are currently available? Thank you. Director Bright. Uh, yeah, through Mr Mayor. No, that won't impact on the uh, Albany Highway um, reciprocal rights of access uh, network policy. Um, the intention for that requirement is more in the Riverside precinct, which is where, for example, the Bunnings, the old Bunnings site is. Um, you know, there's opportunities given it's in the city centre close to Cecil Avenue that any future development on that site in that Riverside precinct uh, can be brought forward closer to Albany Highway uh, rather than having quite a large 15 metre setback. So certainly this won't compromise the existing uh, reciprocal rights of access ways for the majority of the Albany Highway area. It's more so for those properties, um, I guess, the Perth side of Cecil Avenue along that section of Albany Highway, where we're focused on getting a better outcome from a built form perspective. And just with page 189 of the large attach attachments, so 1.4 of Amendment 1, uh, protection of environmental and heritage features. Uh, when does the city expect improved signage to be installed along Halberdy Highway uh, to indicate uh, the location of the homestead and the Kenning River Regional Park? Thank you. Director. Uh, certainly that's uh, an issue that um, probably can't be resolved through the structure plan, but um, certainly we can. I can take that offline and, and report back to Council on where that's at at the moment. Thank you, Councillor Bain. Uh, Councillor Barry? Yes, yeah, just a, a question. The Riverside Precinct, where does that start and stop? I mean, apart from the river, I know that. But. Director? 
Uh, yeah, three, Mr. Mayor. I'll find the I'll find the page uh, if I can. Um, but basically, it's it's around where the Bunnings uh, site is, Richmond Street. So just just that. yeah, around that Richmond Street towards where we are at the moment, um, and it goes back into uh, the residential precinct of, of Carden Drive. But what I can do is um, I'll, yeah. I'll get the right page number in the attachment and make sure councils. Yeah, uh, I'm just I mean, it doesn't get doesn't, the old Bunnings site. Yeah. Sorry. The old Bunnings site. It doesn't go up to like Harvey Norman and past there because that's, I, I don't believe I'm so. But what I'll myself, that's the Riverside. Yeah. Yeah. It's only, it only relates to one block. Uh, it's, 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 only, it's only a very small area, the Riverside oh, Precinct. Okay. It goes back towards the river. Um, certainly, I can, uh, as I say, I'll, I'll point out the actual number Thank in you. an email. And 93, deletion once again for um, covered by SPP73, um, A to M. You know, it's got all those. Is it, and the question I ask is that does that make the design review panel redundant? Director. Uh, no, I think the design review panel would prefer using uh, SPP 7.3 um, because, again, uh, there's a desire to utilise uh, what is a best practice document. Um, you know, SPP 7.3 is in response to some poor apartment designs throughout the whole of metropolitan Perth and uh, certainly it's backed by the design uh, industry. Architects, planners uh, uniformly supported what is being delivered in SPP 7.3. So the design review panel uh, can take into account all those aspects uh, consistently across uh, th yeah, the city of Canning and across other local governments. So we have a number of panel members that sit on various panels throughout metropolitan Perth. So um, it's still very much um, requirements on how to achieve those. There's performance criteria and there's acceptable criteria. So there is still some discretion from an applicant to show how they meet the performance criteria if they can't meet the standardised criteria. And that's where the design review panel's expertise comes to play. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, councillors, before we move on? Councillor Bain. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just looking at that map with the uh, indicative laneways there, so is there a, I'm trying to work out my orientation in regard to it, is there a laneway going behind Pharmacy for Less, just off uh, Cecil Ave there? Uh, Director Bright. Uh, yes, certainly. That's uh, one of the laneways uh, shown on that plan. Um, but as you said before, what we'll do is we'll we'll give you an aerial, which um, you know, for example, that change uh, that goes um, that amendment to the laneway in relation to the Coca Park interface, that that does veer around the running track uh, between a building and the running track, and it also means there's no no cross intersection. Uh, so sight lines are improved. But I think that makes it very clear through the aerial. So we're happy to distribute that. Councillor Barry, two bites of the cherry. Yes, I like cherries. Um, and this is the, the last one. This is where it sprung from. Uh, it says in 23 on page 96, one submission was received from the Department of Communities, who generally supported the amendment, but also requested the flexibility and plan, of planning controls, as they would like the option of group dwellings near school and parks. I'm just wondering how much weight do we get? How much weight do we give that? And why would they ask for that? Thank you. If you can answer Director Bright, are you able to answer that? Yes, yeah, so the Department of Communities are obviously looking at the feasibility of their site. Um, and whilst they're committed to the, um, the density and the built form along the Cecil Avenue frontage, as it sort of, as it sort of moves uh, towards uh, Coker Park and, and the school, um, they're after some flexibility in relation to uh, providing some group dwellings. It could be two-storey townhouse-like development you know, fronting the, the park or the school. Um, again, that wasn't part of the advertised changes and what we're suggesting is that you know, if, they, if they've got an alternative type of development that they want to proceed with in that portion of, of their development site, we'll certainly be open. If we can get a good development outcome, then again, we will we'll certainly uh, look at group dwellings in that location. So I don't think we want to just give it away and allow group dwellings um, over that property. Um, but if they've got a, an actual proposal they can put forward which achieves similar objectives, we're certainly open to look at it. When we say group dwellings and, and two-storey, can you give us some specific as to what, if they didn't ask for that, what would we be saying would be allowed there? Four, five, six-storey? Yeah, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at that particular precinct, look at what it says at the moment in terms of building height, um, but certainly um, 
group dwellings are not a building above another building, so they're two-storey, but they're it's it's lived in by uh, you know one family or one occupant. Um, so that's only a two-storey outcome um, under the structure plan. I'm, I'm confident it's at least three. So those, those things can be looked at as part of a future proposal. I don't think we uh, should degrade or diminish the structure plan now without any formal proposal on the on the books. But yes, certainly I can uh, provide that information of, of what they can do now and what they may wish to see from a built form perspective in terms of height um, on that site. Thanks, councillors. I'd like to keep moving if we can. We've got a fair bit to still get through. If there's no other questions on that item, we'll move to the Orang Road uh, planning study, which is SD 024 of 20. Uh, and uh, let me see. The recommendation is on page 104 of tonight's agenda. It is now on the screen. Are there any questions in regards to that item? None. Uh, one. Councillor Kunza. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I just um, what's proposed is far better than what was proposed in November 2018. Uh, but at that time, they said they were just preparing for potential future uh, developments. Is there has there been any indication from the government whether this would be more immediate, given that, um, as indicated. It's already at capacity. Is this something that's that the government's, I guess, indicating that they'll do in the more short to medium term? Uh, Director, yeah, I might uh, ask uh, Mr. Troy Bozic to answer that. Thank you, Mr. Bozic. Would you step forward, please? Thank you. Uh, microphone. Thank you. Through the mayor, uh, main rays have indicated to us that they're seeking the support of the three councils affected, and then they'll look at putting a submission into Infrastructure Australia. So it is something that from officer level they're looking at quite seriously about. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. I know that the preferred option is option three. Um, it looks really good, but is there any likelihood that they might say they haven't got enough money and go to sort of option option one or option two, which is less than ideal for us? Mr. Bosic. Yes, uh, through the Mayor. Well, they're uh, seeking count all three councils' support for that option three. So, um, of all the work that has been done, they sat down with all the councils, you know, over 12 months ago, looking at all the options. And I think the option that they chose, they have chosen to support, was supported at officer level by all councils. All the others were uh, a configuration of all sorts of things, which wasn't very. Um, which wasn't the best option. So I think the one that they've gone for is, you know, supported by all three councils at officer level. Thank you, Mr. Bozic, uh, for those answers. Uh, councillors, if there's nothing further, we'll move on to uh, the Kent Street Weir um, precinct plan, uh, which is EN 025 of 20. Uh, that item is on page 116 of tonight's agenda. Mr. Warren Bow is the uh, direct, uh, the responsible officer. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Kunza. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, with respect to the upgrade or expansion of Creek, just um, what's the justification? Um, I understand that was built by the state government many years ago, received financial assistance for a um, education officer to provide services to the whole southeast corridor, um, and then that was cut. So I'm just wondering, given it provides uh, services to the whole southeast corridor, what's the uh, business plan in terms of expanding it? Director Bow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there is no business plan for expanding it at the moment, Councillor Kunza. The, the city staff are working with Curtin University to do some uh, work in relation to concepts and designs. Uh, there's obviously competing interests for the space uh, in and around, oh, sorry, in the Creek building. Um, it's our desire to ensure that. Um, the performance and the, the number of people that are using uh, that facility is, is optimised. Um, we think that uh, potentially expanding that would, would cater for a greater number of visit visitations. Uh, can be done in conjunction with the broader redevelopment of the park, um, contemplate some other uh, service offerings from out of the building uh, at that time, and also obviously um, to, the, to the west. Um, real, uh, meet, meet the needs of uh, the lessee in relation to the expansion of the Canning River Cafe. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, yes, Mr Mayor. Um, just with respect to the four options for the Canoe Club facility options, um, was there any uh, investigation or potential with respect to a option between A and B? Um, 
sorry, I, I didn't quite understand why. Um, the now I understand that the officer comment was that um, the best outcome of the Kent Street Weir Master Plan couldn't be, I guess, fulfilled if a larger facility was built. Um, but given that there's option B with a 630 square metre, is there no capacity to have a bigger small watercraft storage at that location and option A? Uh, Director Bo. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, there's, there's certainly an option, um, but uh, the recommendation uh, that has been formulated by you know the various staff that have worked on this is that um, the option and the the provision of storage space for, for the canoe club and the associated clubs there um, would be at a, a, a smaller scale and removed from more centrally located within the precinct to more to uh, the southeast of the creek building. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I got a question that sort of dovetails beautifully on that. Um, with the, I've looked at the, the more detailed map that was sent through. I think it was today, uh, I've got it here, and it's the same as what we've got, but it's just a bit more detail. Um, I look at the map, it says possible CRCC facility, uh, 22 square, 220 metres, square metres. I was just wondering, is it possible to have like an access way to the river from there? Because um, from what I've been hearing, um, a, a canoeist or someone with a boat doesn't want to carry the boat. As, as, as the closest, to, the less effort to put it in the water, the better. So, would it be possible to amend that to have sort of some sort of direct access to the river through those through the vegetation? Uh, Director, has that been considered? It has been considered, Mr. Mayor, uh, and it certainly um, hasn't been formally broached with the DBCA, who have the care and control of that land, and there'd be some other issues regarding potential clearing of the impacts on um, the DBCA land there. But that certainly can be uh, progressed with uh, the DBCA. It's um, you know, not, not the preferred model. Um, by uh, relocating that storage facility to that location, which is on the map. Um, it also requires some modifications to the car parking and some modifications to uh, the path of travel, uh, the width of the uh, width of the footpaths, and and some other issues there, which would aim to um, make the the traversing of the canoes from that uh, location a bit safer. Uh, but there's no no denying that uh, that travel distance is. Um, slightly longer, um, 30 or so metres longer than the travel distance from uh, the current facility occupied by the Canning River Canoe Club. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, so the 140 square metres, is that in fact the 200 on the eastern side? Uh, At some Director? stage or another? Might have to get you to release your uh, microphone there, Councillor. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Barry, are, are you talking about the? All oh, right, in the the re, re, that's referenced in the report, or are you talking about the uh, areas that are identified on the plan? Just use your microphone if you can. I read about the 200 square metres. I'm just wondering whether option A is in fact what is going to be. So option A was uh, the, the option that we presented uh, to the SIB uh, and subsequent discussions with representatives from the Canoe Club identified a preference for a significantly larger area, that 140 square metres option A at paragraph 24 of the report there um, clearly doesn't meet the needs of the uh, Canning River Canoe Club. So the subsequent discussions uh, and including uh, the email that was sent out last week have arrived, uh, have meant that the staff have arrived at a, at a, at a different option, which is you know, the 220 odd square metre area, which is uh, to the immediate southeast of the creek building. So, and my understanding of that is that even though, well, I didn't renege, but they've withdrawn their support for that, if that's correct, because of, um, I think, what um, the Deputy Mayor was saying, the, and wherever I read it, they were going to be carrying their canoes 
on the um, car park, etc. I suppose the the other question I don't know whether you can answer it because if we if we're putting fifty thousand dollars into a feasibility study, is is that basically saying that that's where we really think is the, the best proposition or not? Uh, you're talking about Centenary Avenue. Centenary, yeah. Yep, uh, Director um, Mo. Uh, yeah, that's what we're saying, Mr. Mayor. We're saying that we should investigate the co-location opportunity of um, both the Canning River Canoe Club and a number of other clubs, including uh, the uh, occupiers of the buildings in and around Centenary West, investigating a feasibility study to build a co-located facility there. And given, and given the fact that that's some time away, I would expect, um, as all well, discussions between the city and the canoe club um, got to that point where that has been discussed of this 200 square metres, whether it's temporary or permanent, I can't say one way or the other, but whether that's been discussed up to that point. Director. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, both uh, Executive Man Manager Dion Johnson and myself met with the office bearers of the Canning River Canoe Club last Friday, and, and it's um, it's clear that their preference is not the option that's put forward to council and recommended by uh, the city officers. Um, the the 220 square metre building would be what we would call an interim solution, something that's uh, relatively low cost, but uh, certainly um, not of a um, of a level of service that we would um, mean to build for a long-term, you know, 40-year building, um, and negotiating with with the club uh, or discussing, sorry, with the club the potential co-location uh, of other watercraft activities um, is something that they'd like to see the outcome of the feasibility study on. Um, they're not objecting to the concept, um, but would certainly like to be involved in the feasibility study. Um, my interpretation is that if they got a facility that met their needs and was easily able to provide access to the river for the purposes of their club, um, then they would consider that. But their option, their preference is clearly to stay at uh, Kent Street Precinct. Thanks, councillors. Any other questions before we move on? Sorry, uh, councillor Sabiri, hello. Um, I've got a question in regards to the car park and have we looked at uh, any kind of alternative paving for the proposed extension of the car parks? Um, something more sustainable, I guess, or have we, yeah, I just think the um, idea of having car park here. Yeah. Um, Director, thank you. Where are the options for? Yeah, we, we've certainly co contemplated it, uh, and that will be fleshed out further in detailed design. I share Councillor Sabiri's concern about sterilising large tracts of the area down there with um, sealed and um, pavement, uh, but we'll be looking at some options there. Thanks, Councillors. Oh, Councillor Bain, uh, yes, a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So. Uh, through you to Director Bo, there is uh, no possibility of the interim status of the uh, building to be built next to Creek to changing to permanent for the Canoe Club. Uh, Director? Um, oh, look, I, I couldn't rule that out, uh, Councillor Bain, um, but at the moment um, the intention is to, to build a facility that meets the needs of the club. As, as an interim arrangement, albeit you know, medium to, to you know, of, of a medium term nature, um, the, the long term future and long term location, I think, would be influenced by the outcome of the feasibility study, and that would be subject to a further report to council and council's consideration. Thank you. And uh, just in addition to the questions that were raised earlier during question time, would it be please be possible to provide uh, councillors? Uh, with the map and information as to uh, the extent the site will and the playground cater for uh, people and children with uh, disabilities. Thank you. Director? Oh, unfortunately, that won't be able to be provided prior to the OCM, Councillor Bain. That, that uh, level of detail will only uh, evolve through the detailed design um, process, but certainly in the agenda briefing comment, I can um, unequivocally state that that will be a design parameter for the future detailed design. Um, 
it's not only an obligation um, statutorily, it's a moral obligation as well. And if I could, Mr Mayor, I do intend to, uh, to summarise and include in the AB comment section of the report um, excerpts from the email I sent to uh, the elected members uh, last week, obviously with the publishing of the agenda and the receipt of that email. I think it's important uh, for posterity to have that information uh, in the minutes moving forward. So just to allay any councillors' fee concerns on that. Uh, good, good outcome. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kunza first and then Deputy Mayor. Um, just with respect to the Deputy Mayor's question earlier, I'm not sure if I quite understood it at the time. Um, is there a possibility to provide um, a pathway on the southern side of the buildings, creek and so forth, so that the um, to get from the uh, creek new Canning River Canoe Club facility so that they avoid all the car park and so forth? Or is that area on the southern side of all the buildings, is that DBCA land or is that our land? Uh, Director. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, my understanding it's DBCA land and my further understanding it's within the floodplain. Uh, so any permanent um, path construction within, within that area that would provide a, a, a shorter path of travel would need to be um, suitably designed to um, accommodate um, potential flooding. Uh, so it's probably not going to be feasible, but it, uh, as I'll just reaffirm, we can uh, take that up with the DBCA and, and look at some concepts for that. Yes, Councillor Kunzer. I guess just to follow on, because whilst I recognise you're talking about a feasibility study and so forth, even the challenges that have been highlighted in the Centenary Westland, I mean, the unique thing about this precinct is the fact it's on a river. And so if we build all the, I guess, infrastructure and then find out subsequently that Centenary West is, I guess, not suitable, then what do we do for canoeists in the future? Uh, I don't think there was a question there, but uh, can I just ask from my own, um, just so I've got it clear, are you saying uh, to basically run a, consider running a path in front of, uh, sorry, behind Creek along the balcony there and to meet the path? Is that the southern side that you're talking about? Okay, all right. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Um, we had a question from a gentleman earlier today, and I know you took it on notice, but he was suggesting perhaps it was punch one of those big car parks right down to the back. Um, is that something that would be able to be considered or is it something that's fairly difficult given the advanced nature of this plan? Uh, Director, I'll I'll just seek some, 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 yeah, some clarification as to what you're referencing as the back. Is that uh, towards the direction of the Wilson Lagoon? Can you just yeah, explain much exactly that, where that you oval that we see at the moment. Um, oh, to be to be blunt, no, we wouldn't consider that. That would invite you know, vehicles in effect onto the onto the main space of the of the precinct, and we would certainly want to maintain car parking in and around the periphery. Notwithstanding that, I think you can see on uh, that the um, proposed car park adjacent to Kent Street. There's some hatchings for. Um, disabled bays there. So if, if I guess the concern is the accessibility from um, the car park to the play to the playground already on the concept plans that identifies that, that that's an issue. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be advocating for any major reorientation of um, the car parking into and encroach into uh, the broader Kent Street Weir or Wilson Park area. Thanks, councillors. Uh, let's move it along unless there's any other questions. Uh, we've got um, uh, at item eight, uh, there are none urgent business uh, tonight to discuss. There are none. We have got a number of confidential items to run through. Uh, that's at item uh, 10. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, members of the public for their attendance tonight. Thank you. Uh, ask that they please uh, leave the chamber. Thank you very much, councillors. Uh, thank you very much for um, that final verse. It's uh, half past nine. I think we'll finish up now. Uh, close the business at item 10. There'll be no further business. I declare the agenda briefing closed at 9.30 and um, thank everyone for their attendance.